Hey guys, we are back updating the Power Rankings for Big Brother 26 towards the end of week four. And I feel like this has been another pretty interesting week here, where even though we are probably gonna be losing one of the smaller names in the house, I still feel like there is plenty of interesting stuff happening during the first half of the week, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now I am recording this on Tuesday, August 13th. And if you're new to the channel or only follow the show through the episodes, I will be covering the live feeds and spoiling the video results. So if you don't wanna be spoiled, now's your chance to click out this video. But with all that out of the way, we have 14 players to talk about and it's a waste of more time. Let's go right into the video. So starting off at number 14, we have the latest boot from the season and here we have Kenny. And this was largely to be expected here, especially after Tucker won the AI arena comp as Kenny was a pretty clear backup target here. And once Tucker was safe, he was the next target on the board. Not too surprising there. And I'll be honest, I am kind of glad Kenny is out of the house now considering he didn't really want to be there all that much to the point where even the show was talking about it by the end of it and Julie was calling him out for wanting to quit. And I'm sure Kenny himself is pretty happy to be out of the house now. Now, if you are talking about Kenny as a whole, I feel like he played a pretty bad game, obviously, considering he didn't really want to be there for a lot of it. It seemed like he only got motivated to play when he was in the competitions or when things were going his way. And through that, he never really was involved in anything. He never really was involved in any alliances or power structures. He didn't really play the game for a lot of it. And I feel like at points where he was playing the game, he was doing bad stuff, like talking about the Women's Alliance and wanting to go after them, which caused Alexa Brooklyn to be pretty against Kenny. And again, with his just flip-floppy nature, it just frustrated a lot of people to where by the time he was there on the block, he was just an easy person to take out. Now, I will say that in comparison to people like Lisa, I do think he was a step above them in the sense that there were at least people that wanted to work with him. And had he actually wanted to play the game, he probably could have been picked up as a number at some point. But due to him continually talking about quitting, it just kind of made him an unreliable person to bring in. And he didn't really follow through with a lot of things he wanted to do. So for that reason, I can't really have many higher than number 14. And with that, there are 13 people left in the game to talk about. And as usual, I'll be ranking it based on how lucky I think they are to win the game based off their current game position. But number 13, we have the person who is the most likely to go home on Thursday night. And here we have Mackenzie. Now I will say that kind of similar to some of these other consensus targets from previous weeks, there is a chance that Mackenzie stays here considering you have the AI arena comp. And I feel like she is at least somewhat capable in comps considering she did win that upgrade comp in week one. But obviously she is the main target here where I would assume that if she stays up on the block, she probably goes home against both Cedric and Rabina, which is not particularly great and kind of reflects what I said last week, where it very much felt like the only reason she was not being targeted was due to her power. But the first opportunity that she had no longer has the power she is immediately put up is considered someone to be taken out, despite it not even being in the best interest of everyone involved to take out Mackenzie, where the likes of Brooklyn and Chelsea are better off with Mackenzie still in the game. And while she gets unlucky with Angela winning the HOH comp that took away an easy target for Quinn this week, I feel like Mackenzie herself hasn't really done much to change her position in the game where she still thinks that she has the likes of Chelsea on her side when Chelsea is obviously pretty willing to turn on her. You have her not even being included in the five points alliance that was formed with a lot of the people that she wanted to work with. So I'm not feeling that great about Mackenzie at this point, though obviously if she survives this week, who knows? But I feel like considering that she's likely going to be voted out if she stays up, I do have to leave her here at number 13. Now moving on to number 12, and we have the next most likely person to go home this week. And here we have Rubina. And the fact that Rubina ended up on the block here is kind of insane considering that Quinn didn't even want to put her up and felt like he had to due to her perceived connection with Tucker, even though her and Tucker aren't even that close at this point. Where yeah, while they were seen as this duo from last week, I feel like at this point, Tucker himself has made it clear that he's not going to really sacrifice this game for Rubina at this point. And I feel like a lot of what Tucker has done in the past week to blow up their spot has kind of also reflected poorly on Rubina here. Now, I will also say that Rubina herself didn't play particularly well with Quinn, where she seemed to be one of the few people genuinely upset when Quinn revealed the power and that she wasn't told about it, which is not particularly great. But even so, considering that they had this final two, I feel like Rubina should have easily been able to repair that. But instead, she didn't really do much work to ensure that her and Quinn were good again. And it just made it easier for Quinn to put them up, despite the fact that they had this final two from before. And you also had the likes of Kimo and T-Core, who didn't want her to go up either, only for them to not really do anything to keep her off the block where it felt like this entire situation could have been avoided. But at this point, Rubina is here on the block. And while she probably stays over Mackenzie, if Mackenzie wins the AI arena comp, 
she probably goes home against Cedric, which is not particularly great. And the fact that she could have easily avoided being the renom here is pretty bad on her end. And I feel like as long as Tucker remains in the game, I feel like it'll continue to sink her position further and further until Tucker eventually gets taken out or she gets taken out instead. So I feel like Rubina here is kind of in a bad spot right now, largely due to things outside of her control, but I feel like she hasn't really done more to counter that, which is why she's here at number 12. Now moving on to number 11, and we have someone who I mentioned not long ago, but we do have Tucker. And Tucker is pretty much on the bottom at this point where he is essentially banking on winning competitions. And while he puts his money where his mouth is by winning the veto once again, he once again considers not using it on himself, largely due to him wanting to take on Cedric in the AI arena comp. And while he does eventually come around to using it on himself, the fact that he once again considered not using it on himself and even the fact that he didn't use it on himself last week is really insane. And he's essentially banking on winning competitions to get through the game at this point, which is not a very reliable way of getting through. And he's kind of also lucky that the AI arena comp is even there to begin with, where had it not been there, he would have easily been backdoored this week. And it's unclear how long the AI arena twist will even last on the season, where if it's gone next week, he'll easily be backdoored if he doesn't win HOH. So again, I feel like Tucker is in a very precarious spot at this point. And I think a lot of it stems from his blow from the past week, where before that he was relatively safe in the game. And I feel like had he not blown up on Quinn like that, he probably would have continued to be in a good spot. But instead, he just ends up making himself a big target in the house while also locking in the collective in the Pentagon, which before then had not been a very strong alliance. But I feel like through Tucker becoming this consensus enemy, it has kind of forced that group to work together to take out Tucker. So I feel like Tucker has done himself very little favors and I'm not entirely sure how well he's going to do moving forward, which is why he's here at number 11. Now moving on to number 10, and we have someone who has moved up slightly from last week, but more so because they're safe than because of anything they did particularly well, but we do have Angela, and Angela is safe for the week. She did win the HOH comp in a spot to where she would have been put up had she not won that comp, though obviously we have Quinn taking over her HOH here. And it is kind of funny seeing her continuing to try to influence the week, even though she really has no power outside of safety here. But I also think she's kind of being harmed by her connection to Tucker, where she is one of the few people that is willing to work with Tucker, which has caused her to be a target, where I feel like in the future, if Tucker is still in the game, she could easily be a secondary target to weaken Tucker. So I feel like her position there is not particularly great. Though at the same time, you do also to give her some credit for some things where she was able to convince Tucker to actually use the veto on himself for once, which again is somewhat good work there. But beyond that, I'm still not feeling that great about Angela. And aside from the fact that she's safe for this week, I still feel like she's not going to be in a great spot moving forward, which is why she's here at number 10. Now moving on to number nine, and this person has also moved up from last week, not because of anything they did particularly well, but because of other people moving down. But we do have Leah. And it is kind of crazy as well that Leah is safe this week, despite Quinn being HOH and despite her trash talking Quinn to other people in the house to where this should have easily gotten back to Quinn and in turn Quinn probably would have put her up. Where Quinn has even said after the veto ceremony that he probably wants Leah to go up at some point, that he doesn't really see a connection with her at this point, which to be fair can also be drawn back to Leah not really managing that relationship. But the fact that Leah essentially gets away with trash talking Quinn and the fact that Kimo and T-Core don't tell Quinn about all this stuff about Leah being against him is really insane. And I can't really give Leah any credit for it considering it's more so due to the passiveness of Kimo and T-Core that keeps her safe here. Where had they actually told Quinn the information, there is a shot that she would have gone up here and she probably would have gone home had Mackenzie won the AI arena comp. And while losing Mackenzie this week would not be a massive blow to Leah's game, it probably should have considering that they were working with Matt in week one and that they were at the bottom in similar positions. But despite that, they never really got to work together that much and they never really trusted each other that much, which is also kind of a knock there. So I, I feel like Leah is someone who has not really impressed me and is probably someone that should be on the block right now. And I can't really give them much credit for not being on the block which is why they're here at number nine. Now moving on to number eight, and this person has continued to slide as I think more and more about their game. But number eight, we do have Cam. And I feel like Cam is just not playing that hard as I feel like he's definitely one of the more passive players in the house. 
And I feel like at this point, his position has continued to weaken, where you still have Chelsea not really trusting him that much due to his perceived connection with Cam. And the fact that they never repaired that relationship is kind of mind boggling there. You also have him not really fighting that hard to keep Cedric off the block, where I feel like Cedric is a pretty big shield for Cam at this point. He needs Cedric in the game. But despite that, you have him talking to Quinn and Quinn's talking about putting up Cedric and he doesn't really fight that hard to keep Cedric off the block. And sure enough, Cedric is now there in a spot to where he theoretically could go home which is something that could have been avoided in itself but I think probably the biggest knock to Can's game from this week is that he just completely loses his relationship with Tucker where Tucker was someone that he was working with earlier on and someone who he wanted to save as recently as last week but now Tucker doesn't even trust him where Tucker felt like his reaction to him winning the AI arena comp was pretty fake and at this point Tucker doesn't really trust him at this point so I feel like Cam is just letting the game slip him by and it's not particularly great. I feel like Cam hasn't really done anything to prop him up in my power ranking. If anything, he's kind of gone down, which is why he's here at number eight. Now moving on to number seven. And from a pure positioning standpoint, this person should be one spot higher, but I feel like this person made a really dumb move this week. But number seven, we do have Cedric. And Cedric volunteers for the block which I feel like in itself is completely unnecessary. He did not need to do that. And he fails to beat Tucker in the veto comp. And he's now sitting there on eviction night competing in the AI arena comp. Now, to be fair, he is the safest person of those three where I feel like he should be pretty safe regardless of whether he's next to McKenzie or Rabina. But this is another situation that should have been entirely avoided. I feel like that's a common theme with this week of people like not really doing things that are necessary to happen and I feel like Cedric's here was entirely unnecessary and now you have Tucker actively coming for Cedric where Tucker still thinks that Cedric betrayed him even though that's not technically true where Cedric did tell him that he was not going to put Quinn up but still Tucker still is against him there where we saw this play out with Tucker's veto decision where one of the reasons why Tucker was considering not using the veto on himself was because he wanted to take on Cedric in the AI arena comp because he wanted to be the one to take Cedric out of the game, which in turn is driven by a misconception that Tucker thinks Cedric would go out if he stayed up on the block, which is not true. But Tucker is very much against Cedric, more so than he's interested in keeping Rabin in the game, which is really bad. And I feel like Cedric definitely has a major hole there. So I feel like it's not looking great for Cedric on that end. That and also him putting himself on the block for no reason is such a big knock for me that he has dropped here to number seven. Now moving on to number six and we have the current HOH, but we do have Quinn. And again, I feel like if we are talking purely about positioning, I do feel like Quinn is probably below Cedric at this point as I feel like Quinn is not playing particularly well at all. He still has the same issue of revealing way too much information, but at the same time, I feel like he has really failed this week in terms of getting information about his own game, where he still has not figured out that Lee is actively against him in the game, which is pretty bad there. And it kind of led to him making some questionable decisions where he ends up putting Rabina up as a replacement nom instead of Leah. And yes, while you do have to fault other people for not telling him about the Lee information, I feel like Quinn himself really wastes his HOH in terms of getting the information he needs to really make an effective decision. And at the same time, you have him not really building a new power structure at this point, where his plan is to ride out with the Collective and Pentagon until Tucker's out of the game and then flip the game on the Collective, which again, you can kind of see the argument there. But the fact that he's not using his HOH to build a new power structure or to further lock in his position with the Collective and Pentagon is not particularly great in my eyes. You also have the fact that Tucker is still very much against Quinn at this point and probably will go after him along with Cedric if he wins HOH. And again, I feel like Quinn kind of wasted this opportunity where at this point he's potentially losing Rabina, someone that he didn't even want to put up at the beginning of the week and felt like he had to due to his connection with Tucker, even though there was a pretty easy alternative in Leah there. And I feel like with him not really like changing things or turning things around, I can't really have him too much higher than here with the only upside to Quinn's game being that he's eligible to be in the next HOH and through that he could get another opportunity to remain in power but I feel like with the way he is right now, I can't have him any higher than number six. Now moving on to number five, and admittedly this person is a bit too high here, though I feel like compared to the other people that came before them, I guess I have Joseph here at number five. Now again, I still feel like Joseph's kind of in a weird spot here, where even though he is in a better spot than where he was before, I still feel like he's a bit too overconfident about his spot in the game, where he seems to think that he's his big mastermind that's sort of putting everything together. 
And even though now the collective is becoming more of a solidified power structure, which is something that he was actively pushing for in the last couple of weeks, I still feel like Joseph is a bit too overconfident. And I feel like he has some not great reads on the game where I feel like he's underestimating certain people like Brooklyn, for instance. He also has some sloppy play, like telling Mackenzie that she may be in danger at the beginning of the week, which was not a great move as it could have opened things up for Mackenzie to throw him under the bus. But I still feel like Joseph is probably in a better position now than where he was before, where at this point, Quinn has made it clear that he does value Joseph's final two a lot. And again, with the collective becoming more of a solid power structure, that is beneficial to Joseph. And I feel like he's probably now safer in the game than where he was before. But I still think this is a little high for him. It's more so because the other players we already talked about either made bigger mistakes than him or in worse positions than him. That kind of leaves him here at number five. Now moving on to number four. And these two players are back to back. And they're kind of in similar spots at this point. And they may be a bit too high here, but again, with the field that we're working with, at number four, I do have Kimo. And I am a bit disappointed by Kimo at this point. I feel like this past week, he hasn't really played very well, where you have his relationship with Tucker that feels more so emotional than anything strategic at this point, which is not particularly great. And you also have Quinn sort of revealing that he doesn't really value Kimo's final two with him very highly, as Quinn recognizes that Kimo's closer to T-Core than he is to him. So I feel like that kind of has weakened Kimo's spot to a degree, but I feel like a major issue that I have with Kimo's game, and this actually goes for the next person on this list, is that he doesn't tell Quinn about Leah being against him. Where it's pretty obvious that Kimo and Tikor didn't want Rubina to go up on the block here as Rubina's essential to their position within the game, and they had this very easy opportunity of telling Quinn that Leah's been trash talking Quinn, and that Leah's pretty clearly more so against Quinn than Quinn seems to realize. And despite him talking about wanting to do this with Tikor over and over again, he never actually does it. He never actually sits down with Quinn and tells him the information that he needs to keep Rubina safe. And now because of that, Rubina's on the block in a spot to where Rubina could go home if Mackenzie wins the AI arena comp. And Rubina going home would be disastrous to Kimo and Tigor's position here as it would hand a lot more power in the game to the Brooklyns and Chelsea's of the world. So I feel like Kimo kind of just let the game pass him by this week and yes, well, now we're seeing him consider talking with Quinn about it. It's too late. Quinn already has Rubina on the block, and there's not really much Quinn can do about it at this point. And I feel like Kimo and Tico are largely to blame here, which is why he's here at number four. Now moving on to number three, and we have someone who I just mentioned, but we do have Tico. And Tico has the exact same problem with Kimo, where, again, she knows that Rubina is good for her game, and she didn't want Rubina to even go up on the block. And despite Quinn also kind of being on board with that, she doesn't do anything about it. She doesn't do anything to keep her being a safe, despite her knowing that there's a very easy way to keep her being a safe. And I feel like that's a pretty bad knock to her game there. Now, again, beyond that, there is some positive with Kimo and T-Core here where they do build this alliance called the Five Points, which, again, is not a super solid alliance because Tucker's in it. And Tucker's obviously a pretty massive target at this point. But I do feel like T-Core is probably starting to be in a slightly better spot than Kimo. I feel like T-Core is a bit more safe in the game, but I feel like they're both around the same level and they kind of been working together for a lot of the game, but they had that really annoying issue with them of just them just not actually doing anything to help their own game, which is why they're here at number three. Now moving on to number two, and the, I feel like these two players are clearly the best position in the game at this point, and it's just a matter of ordering them. But number two, I did decide to go with Chelsea. And Again, I feel like Chelsea and Brooklyn are essentially in the center of the game right now, where at this point you have the collective and Pentagon really solidifying. And admittedly, I think Chelsea's a bit better positioned within that power structure compared to Brooklyn, though we've also seen Brooklyn branch out on her own through five points and building a stronger bomb with Chemo and t -Core here. So I feel like through that, Chelsea and Brooklyn are in pretty solid positions at this point. However, I think there are two main reasons why I have Chelsea in number two here. One is that she wants to take on Mackenzie, where I think taking on Mackenzie is a pretty clear mistake for both Brooklyn and Chelsea, as Mackenzie seems closer to them than other people are, and it also keeps Rubina in the game, who is a clear number for the Kimo t -Core side. I feel like taking on Rubina would be much better for their position, as it would basically force Kimo and t -Core to work more with them, and while they may get that outcome anyway if Mackenzie wins the AI arena comp, the fact that they are leaning towards taking out Mackenzie here is not ideal, but I think the other main reason is I feel like Chelsea is a bit more noticed in the game where 
I feel like more people are talking about how Chelsea is the best player in the game, where Quinn has clocked her at this point as being the best player in the game and is talking about that with other people. And I think through that, I feel like Chelsea is more likely to be targeted at some point compared to Brooklyn. Or I feel like Chelsea is, again, more so being recognized for playing the better game. And I feel like people are kind of sleeping on Brooklyn, which is obviously more detrimental to Chelsea here. So I feel like those distinctions were enough to leave Chelsea here at number two, even though I feel like she's still in a pretty solid position. And now at number one, the person I believe is the most likely to win Big Brother 26 at this point is Brooklyn. And I feel like a lot of the same things apply to Brooklyn here as they do with Chelsea. I still think that taking on Rubino would be much better for Brooklyn's game compared to Chelsea's. Though I think compared to Chelsea, I think it wouldn't be as bad for Brooklyn considering she is part of five points with Rubino while Chelsea is not. So I do think Brooklyn could benefit a bit more from Rubina being in the game. But I think beyond that, we've also learned this week that Brooklyn is in this pretty solid position where she has a final two with Chelsea. We've also learned that Quinn is the closest to Brooklyn out of all of the people he has final twos with, which is pretty impressive there. And plus, I still think people are kind of sleeping on Brooklyn here where people like Joseph have underestimated Brooklyn in his own cam talks. And I feel like compared to Chelsea, I feel like Brooklyn is a bit more under the radar compared to Chelsea, which I feel like will be pretty beneficial as well. Now, there's still the issue about Brooklyn being a bit too passive in the game. And again, I'm not going to lie, that's still an issue there. And I think the whole Rubina McKenzie debate is a clear example of that. But I think compared to everyone else, I think Brooklyn is clearly in the best position in the game at this point. And I feel like if she's able to pull in the reins, I think she could be a pretty dangerous player and really lock things in that are able to propel her moving forward. So I feel like for all those reasons, I think Brooklyn is a pretty clear number one for me, which is why she's here at number one. And there we go. That will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps with the channel. I'll be back again next week to update the Power Kings again, so you can look forward to that. I am also on Patreon and have a YouTube membership, so if you want to consider supporting the channel, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. And you can also join the Discord server by also clicking the link in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way. But for now, that is the video. See ya.